Well, thank you very much for your warm welcome. It's always a pleasure as well as a privilege to come along and minister here in Carloway. Uh, let's begin our uh, service of worship by singing to God's praise from Psalm 107. You'll see it on your screens coming up. And we sing verses 1 to 9. It is a double common meter. But let me just read the first verse. Oh, thank the Lord, for he is good. His love endures always. Let those whom God redeemed say this, those rescued by his grace. I would go down to uh, the middle of verse 8. And from the awesome deeds of power which he for them achieved, for hungry souls he fills with good, the thirsty he relieves. Psalm 107, verses 1 to 9. <coughs> oh, thank the Lord for he is good, his love endures always. Let Father in heaven. We bow our heads before you, the great God of all the earth, the sole proprietor of everything, the one who does not tire, faint, or get weary, the one who is incontestably sovereign, all powerful, ultra discerning, the creator, the lawgiver, the judge, and we praise you most of all for the Saviour. You are a God who saves, who saves sinners, sinners responsible for bringing the curse 
in your creation. We come before you then, gracious God, humbly, remembering that we're the source of all the damage in this world. We caused it. We human beings are the ones responsible for the virus that brings death. But we come boldly nonetheless, because we come in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus, whom we've already heard about. And we ask for his sake that you would hear our prayers and our petitions. We thank you from the heart that you sent him into this world for the specific reason of pain for our sins. Thank you, Lord. Thank you from the heart for sending Christ to pay for our sins. We have no other hope of getting to heaven, but we don't need any other hope. He is sufficient. And he's now at your right hand, exalted, a prince and a saviour. And he can give repentance and forgiveness of sins for the asking. May every single one of um, us ask for your Holy Spirit to give us this faith in Christ, this faith that saves the soul. We pray your blessing upon us as we gather today. We pray your blessing on this congregation of your people. We ask that you remember them, that you bless them, and that you be with them pastor, session, diaconate, members, all who attend here. Bless the community with an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would graciously remember uh, not only your church at this time, we give you thanks that there are so many faithful ministries on this island. And we pray for everyone today. In fact, we pray for every person who stands in a church. In Christ's name, preaching against sin, preaching Christ crucified as the only remedy. We thank you for each one. But we pray for the nations of the world, and not least for those at war. We pray for the horrors going on in Ukraine and Russia itself and Lord what about Gaza what can we say what can we pray oh Lord come down may the Prince of Peace your dearly beloved son visit them and bless them and remember them we pray for our politicians worldwide Lord we pray that they be guided by your Spirit to do what's wise, to do what's right, to do what your word prescribes. And we do confess national sins. We have removed intentionally. We have intentionally removed every remembrance of your word from our statute book. And therefore, we stagger from one different crisis to another. But we do ask and we do pray, Heavenly Father, that for Christ's sake, you would raise us up again. That you would raise up and put in power those who would fear you and legislate according to your word. We pray for this blessing on our nation and indeed on the whole generation. We pray for any who are bereaved, comfort, console. Encourage, strengthen, bless all such. We pray for those who are seriously ill. Bless medication, treatment, therapies, surgery, etc. Where they are available and where they are not available. May it please you to heal apart from any human means. If this be to your glory and for their good. We ask you, Lord, to remember our young people, 
growing up in an age of license, where they're encouraged to trifle and experiment with what your word forbids. O Lord, have mercy on them. Assure parents and all who work with young people that their labor is not in vain as far as the Lord is concerned. Bless our children growing up in this day and age, we pray, Lord. And especially parents struggling with many issues to deal with. Grant grace and blessing. And now, Lord, as we sing your word, read your word, expound your word, pray your word, hear in mercy, answer in peace, because we pray all in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. <coughs> Boys and girls, it's great to see you out. It is great to see children in the church in these days. And you know, my wife says to me, will you not tell a children's story for the sake of the adults? So I'm going to tell you a wee story. It's about a man who was asked to deliver a letter. It was in the olden days and he had to walk. He didn't have a horse and that was the only way to get about. He was told to deliver this letter to a certain place. And off he went with the letter. And he came back after a while and he went to his boss who told him to go deliver this letter. And he said, well, did you deliver the letter? He said, no, I didn't. Why not? Well, he said, I came to a river and I couldn't get across the river. So I just had to come back. And there's your letter. Oh, he said. He says, was there not a ferryman at the river to take you across? Yes, he said, there was a ferryman. Well, he says, why did you not ask? Did you not ask him to come for you? Oh, he says, the ferryman was at the other side. Oh, but he says, if you shout across, he'll hear you all right. Did you shout to him to come over for you? And he said, no, no, I didn't. I just came home. And his boss said, oh, you fool. You fool. That ferryman has come over for every person that's called out to him. And if you had called out to him, he would have come over and taken you across safely. But you didn't call out to him. You're a fool. And you know, boys and girls, at the end of this world, there's going to be a day of judgment. The whole world will be assembled before God. I will be asked just one or two important questions. Did you ever hear about Jesus? Well, you heard about him this morning. Did you ask him to save you? Did you ask him to forgive you your sins? And that will be the all-important question. Because, you see, every one of us sin. Every one of us does wrong things. So the question will not be, have you ever done anything wrong? Have you ever sinned? No, 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 no. The question will be, did you ask Jesus to forgive you your sins? And he will forgive you if you only believe. There's a verse in the Bible that says, whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the gospel which we preach. And it's real, and it's true, and it's for you, young people, and old people, anyone. If you call on Jesus and ask him to forgive you, especially after you've done something wrong. Because, you know, the natural thing to do when you do something wrong is run away and pretend you didn't do it and cover up. Never do that. Whenever you do something wrong, immediately ask Jesus to forgive you your sins. And he will. At the very time you ask him. Okay? Very good then. Well, now let's turn to the Bible. 
Uh, let's turn to the book of Acts, chapter 8, and we'll read from verse 4 to verse 35. Acts, chapter 8, at verse 4. <clears throat> Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Jesus went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds, with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. When they heard him and saw the signs that he did, for unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much joy in that city. But there was a man named Simon, who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seen signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the hands of the apostles, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Now when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him, and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life 
is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. And may God bless to us the very reading of his own word. We'll sing again to the praise of God, the same psalm, Psalm 107, page 144, if you're looking at your praise book, and it's verses 13 to 20 that we sing now. Psalm 107, verse 13, down to verse 20. Then to the Lord they cried for help. He saved them from their doom. He broke away their cruel chains and brought them out of gloom. Psalm 107, verses 13 to 20. <coughs> then to the Lord they cried for help. He saved them from their doom. He broke away their cruel chains and brought Let's turn in our Bibles to the passage of Scripture which we read in the book of Acts, chapter 8. And while I want to refer to much of what we read, we'll maybe just uh, read again verse 35. <coughs> then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this Scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. Well, in the passage we read from verse 4, we read about two people who professed Christianity. Simon the sorcerer and the Ethiopian eunuch. One was right and one was wrong. There's a false profession of a shrewd trickster. Simon the sorcerer, first of all, and then there's the, there's the genuine conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, a humble believer in Christ. So let's look at both these incidents to see what we can learn. First of all, briefly, the false profession of Simon the sorcerer. Look at his faith, his nature, his response. Briefly, his faith. What did he believe? He actually believed and followed Philip, the 
You read verse 12. It's Philip he believed. What he believed was the things about the kingdom of God. He believed about them. He believed in God, believed in heaven, believed in hell, believed in sin, about these things. What he actually believed was the miracles. That's what he believed. What he could see with his eyes. But these things he heard about, he only learned ab heard, believed about them. He didn't believe in them. You see, it's not people believe about Christ, but it's believing in Christ that saves. Do you believe? Uh, do you believe in Boris Johnson? We all believe about him. Eh? Who believes in him? See the difference? There's very few intelligent people don't believe about Jesus Christ. Very few intelligent people. The evidence is so strong. But it's not enough to believe about him. You have to believe in him and on him. That was his faith. It wasn't a faith in Christ or on Christ. Just about the things he did and said. What about his nature? Well, 21 to 23 tells us his heart was not right with God. You see, religion's about the heart. It's about our nature. And we do wrong things because our heart is not right. His heart was not right. He was never changed, never born again. Verse 22 tells us he had wicked intentions. Simon the sorcerer was devising, plotting, contriving plans. He was planning to, oh, some fearful thing with the power he had. He was interested in the power. He wasn't interested in being changed. He wasn't interested in being forgiven. He interested in power. And verse 23 says it all. The Bible never lies. You're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Now these terms are terms which actually mean Simon was controlled by a bitter spirit. He was intentionally promoting and scheming evil. He had a deep, deep craving for power, fame and fortune. Simon a sorcerer is not a case of someone being deceived. You feel sorry for him. The very opposite. He wasn't being deceived. He was deceiving the church. He was deceiving the Christians. They were plotting. They were scheming. And it's all proved, thirdly, by his response to what Philip said. And that is the saddest thing of all. He was told his condition. He was told his sin. He was told what to do. You pray and all can be forgiven. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Confess your sins. Ask for forgiveness and you're forgiven. Simple. Hard to do, am I right? Very simple. Hard to do. You have to admit you've done wrong. Couldn't do it. Simon never mentions his sin. He never mentions repentance. He never mentions the need to be changed and need for a new heart. He never even mentions forgiveness. Simon's only, es only concern is to escape judgment. Now that's perfectly natural. That's perfectly natural. No one wants to go to hell. Even the wicked don't want to go, go to hell. It's just that they don't believe in the place. That's perfectly natural not to want to go to hell. So he says, you pray. I'm not going to pray, but you pray I won't go. It's, I find so sad. You never ask for forgiveness. We're back to the children's story. Ask for Jesus to forgive you. He died 
so that you'd have the power to forgive people that sin. Just ask him to forgive you. That's the gospel. There's nothing else. That would sta- that's what starts off this chain change of life. He's nothing to say to God anymore. There's no prayer of sin. There's no fear of God. There's no desire for forgiveness. No faith in the gospel. There's no Jesus Christ anymore. So let's change the subject. Let's now look at the genuine conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. I read somewhere. There was probably no one else on earth more unlikely to become a Christian. I've read that. He was one of the most unlikely people on earth to become a Christian. Here he is leaving the most likely place on earth where he would be converted, become a Christian. Jerusalem, Israel. You see, you've heard of Jews and Gentiles. And you can divide the world into two by saying Jews or Gentiles. Because what is, it? what is a Gentile? Any person on earth is a Gentile if he's not a Jew. A Gentile is someone who's not a Jew. So here is this Gentile. And what a lot there is against this man ever becoming a Christian. Because, first of all, as I've said, he was a Gentile. Now the Jews were the people of God. God chose the Jewish race that he would send his word that they would be able to have the oracles of God which is just the Bible, the word of God from heaven, it was left, it was deposited with the Jews, who were, incidentally, when the time came, whose job was to spread this gospel to the Gentiles, but they wouldn't do it. They were proud, proud. God spoke to us. We got the tablets, the two table tablets of stone, direct from God, written with his finger. We are the people. Have you heard that before? We are the people that was the Jews, proud, proud. And their job was to keep the oracles of God and eventually, when the time came, to tell all the other nations. But they haven't done it yet. But can you hear what Satan will be whispering to the Ethiopian eunuch? If God wanted you to be a Jew, a Christian, he'd have made you a Jew. That's where God's word is. That's where God's people is. That's where God's house is in Jerusalem, the capital. God can't want you to be a Christian. Or he'd have made you a Jew. Never, ever listen to that whisper. Whoever says it, it'll come from below. It'll come from the pit of hell. Never listen to anyone that says that. The gospel is not for you. Christ is. But there's something else against the Ethiopian unit. Not just that he was a Gentile, but he was an Ethiopian. Now, I don't know why. I've never been able to discover why. And I've spent a little bit of time. But for some reason, to the Jew, the most despicable person on earth was the Ethiopian. Uh, and there's a, a verse in the Bible which says, Ethiopia to God will soon stretch out her hands. Meaning, here's this unbelievable news. Ethiopia! Ethiopia becoming Christians! No, oh, can't believe it. Well, the eunuch was an Ethiopian. There'd be no people of God, no Israelites ever praying for Ethiopia. Here he is, and can you hear him saying, if God wanted me to become a Christian, he wouldn't have made me a Gentile, and he wouldn't have made me an Ethiopian, because there's no one praying for me. 
But there's something else here, even more than that. This Ethiopian eunuch had great riches and power. He was tremendously well off. He was today's equivalent of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. All the treasure, all the money in Ethiopia was at his disposable, uh, disposal. We heard it there, verse 27. He arose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candice, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He was the chancellor of the exchequer. He had millions, or oh, equivalent today, of billions at his disposal. Wealthy, wealthy, wealthy person. But do you remember what Jesus said about the wealthy? Do you remember how hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven? Can you hear what Satan whispered to him? If God wanted you to be a Christian, he wouldn't have made it so hard for you. What a lot's against this man becoming a Christian. But there's even something more against him ever becoming a Christian. And that's the fact that he was a eunuch. You see, I've mentioned before how privileged the Jewish race was and how only the Jews had the word of God, the house of God, and the people of God. But there was a system, there was an arrangement within Judaism whereby somebody could become a proselyte, what they call a full proselyte, or a God-fearer. And that is, if any Gentile, not born a Jew, if he heard about the God of Israel and said, hey, I think that's the real God. I think that's the only God. That's the God I want. I want to, I want to worship this God. There was an arrangement whereby Gentiles could become what they call proselytes, or God-fearers. But there were seven stages in becoming a proselyte, a full proselyte. Seven steps in becoming a proselyte. And everyone that wanted to be a God-fearer or a proselyte could come along among them and be a proselyte. Except, except the eunuch. The eunuch was only allowed to take the six steps. He was never allowed to take the seventh step and become a full proselyte. You can hear the devil, can't you? You can hear himself, can't you? If, if, if God wanted me, he wouldn't have made me a eunuch. And you know, there was something else about the eunuch. Not only could he not become a full proselyte taking the seven steps, he was actually forbidden. Eunuchs were forbidden to enter the congregation of the Jews. Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, spells it out. Forbidden to enter the congregation. What does our text say? What was he doing? He went to Jerusalem to worship. He never got in, it seems. He never got in. He tells us he, he was returning. He was coming back from Jerusalem. Possibly didn't get past the door. You see, we read there, he was a, he was a, an, a, a court official. For some reason, eunuchs, did have this on their side. They got into, they got very high positions in government. And he was a government official. And apparently they had some kind of uniform so you could tell right away. Imagine, it seems, he arrived at the court of the temple. And the men at the door said, Are you a eunuch? Sorry, sorry, you can't get in.
Can you hear the devil? Can you hear? Can you imagine what he felt like? God doesn't want me in his kingdom. Eh? Well, there was all these things against him. But you know this? According to secular history, it's not according to the Bible, but according to secular history, he eventually became the first bishop of Ethiopia, the Episcopal Church. Anyway, how did it all happen? How come this man got into the kingdom of heaven? Well, there was all these things he had against him. But there was a couple of things that were for him. Number one, he has a few pages of the Bible. Only a few pages. There were no Bibles in these days. There's no Bibles. There's no books. But there were scrolls. And you didn't get a whole... The Bible, well, you know that. 66 books compiled together. How did he get hold of it? A eunuch from Ethiopia. How did he get hold of it? Well, we don't know. And it actually doesn't matter. But I found it very interesting. I read once, are we allowed to use sanctified imagination? Are you allowed here? Here's just something I heard, and it's very interesting. Maybe, oh, it's imagination, maybe when he was rejected from the church, from the temple, he was in an, must have been in an awful state, turned away from the house of God. Maybe he wandered into the streets of Jerusalem and saw the Old Testament equivalent of a Bible bookshelf. Maybe I'll go in there. He goes in there and he says to the bookshop manager, tell me, have you anything for a eunuch? I've just been turned away from the house of God. Have you anything in your bookshop for a eunuch? He's a good manager. He's a good bookshop manager. He knows his Bible. Ah, he knows. There is, there's a verse in the Bible in the Old Testament, you know, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 56. It says something there about eunuchs. Let me read it to you. Isaiah 56, verse 4. Thus says the Lord to the eunuchs, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. There's an Old Testament promise to eunuchs, despised, rejected. There's a promise when the New Testament comes. When the New Testament has come, it has started in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is a transitional period from the Old Testament ways of worshipping God to the New Testament ways. But he hasn't reached chapter 56 because it's not divided at the chapter's end. But he's reading the scroll, the few pages in the middle or toward the end of the book of the writings of the prophecies of Isaiah. And he's only at chapter 53 reading about Christ, reading about the sufferings of Jesus. And he asks him a question. Who's this we're reading about? Who's this man that was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities? Who is he? Who is he? How can I get hold of him? And that's the second thing that's in his favour. Number one, He's got a couple of pages of the Bible. Number two, he is a preacher of good news. 
You've got the word of God, but he doesn't understand it. So he asks the servant of God, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? How can I get to know more about this man? And Philip, as our text says, told him the good news about Jesus. There were good signs. There were good signs. Oh, there were bad signs. But there were good signs. You see, he genuinely sought God. He genuinely sought salvation. He genuinely sought forgiveness. Simon the sorcerer sought power. Simon the sorcerer sought publicity. He wanted power. What are you seeking? Forgiveness? Pardon? Salvation? God? But you'll get it in Jesus. You'll get it in Christ. Another good sign, not, it's not only what he saw, but he wanted to understand about Jesus. He wanted to understand the word. You know, there are people, and they can quote the Bible by the square meter, but they don't understand it. Don't understand it. Vital to understand this book. Some of it is very, very hard. Peter, Peter said that about Paul, or was it Paul who said it about Peter? So, of which some things hard to be understood. You know the best way to understand what God is saying? Look at Jesus. Look at Christ. He's the way to the Father. And Jesus himself said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you want to know God? Know Jesus. Know Christ. That's what's vital. That's what's important. You've got to a desire to understand what all this is about. Simon only wanted to understand how you get the power of miracles. I want this be I want to be able to do this miracle. But the Ethiopian eunuch, I want to understand why Christ died. Why did Christ die? Why did he die for someone like me? That's where salvation is. That's where forgiveness is. That's where pardon is. Interested in the death of Christ. Well, just in conclusion, two things. Number one, we better ask, what then is a Christian? Here we have two examples of professions, one right, one wrong. What is a Christian? Who is a Christian? It is someone who is depending on the death of Christ to take them to heaven. You see, there were three people crucified that Friday afternoon. Three. Why is it the one in the middle was different? Why? Try and understand it. He'd never committed a sin. And yet he was punished physically uh, and indeed spiritually for all the sins of everyone that will be in heaven. Do you believe Christ on the center cross that Friday afternoon was paying God for the sins of everyone who will be in heaven? That's the gospel. That's what a Christian is. And it's life-changing. You believe that you love Christ and you'll want to follow Christ. That's where salvation is in Him. He really did pay God for the sins of other people. And the other people is any person 
to depend on Christ for forgiveness. That's what a Christian is. But the other thing to note, and it's quite uh, in conclusion, the other thing to note, which is hugely interesting and, and encouraging, here's Philip. Where is he when we read about him first? You know where he is? He's an evangelist. There's a campaign going on. And the campaign's in Samaria. Half Jew. Well, who means half Jew? Philip's preaching at the campaign in Samaria. The campaign's going great. The campaign's going great. Samaria turned to the Lord. There's people there being converted. So much so that as you read, if you read the whole chapter, you'll find out they had to send to Jerusalem for more workers, more preachers, more evangelists. The campaign's going terrific. And they're sending to Jerusalem for more evangelists. And God says to an evangelist that's in the campaign, Philip, come here. Come here, Philip. Come here. I want you to go to a desert one man there seeking me. And I'm moving my evangelist from the thriving campaign that's going on in Samaria for one man, one lonely man in the desert. He's got a couple of pages of my word, but he's not following it. Go and explain to that one man in the desert God is interested in one isolated sinner seeking him. You're not alone, friend. You're seeking God, seeking forgiveness, seeking pardon. God is seeing him. God is seeing you. Any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved, even although they're an Ethiopian eunuch. May God the Holy Spirit make his word effectual to every one of us. Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, be pleased to take the things of Christ and make them ours here today in your house. We pray that your Holy Spirit would give us this faith which saves the soul. Keep us in your love, keep us in your truth. For all we ask and all we pray, we ask and pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll conclude our service of worship by singing from Psalm 118. If you're using the Blue Praise Book, it's page 399. And we sing verses 22 to 29. Psalm 118, verse 22. And it's speaking about Christ. That stone is made head corner stone which builders did despise. This is the doing of the Lord and wondrous in our eyes. We'll sing from Psalm 118, verse 22 to the end of the psalm. That stone is made head cornerstone which builders did Say. 
Amen.